Jesus explains. Mary and Martha, look from my perspective and consider your ways. August 22, 2015. Words from Jesus to Sister Claire, spoken by Jackie. Claire began. The Lord is blessing us, dear heart dwellers, with his insights. I have a beautiful example tonight to share with you. And tonight the Lord seems to be confirming the message of the wineskins. So I'd like to go ahead and share with you what he showed me. He asked me to. He showed me a vision of Martha and Mary. And I said, Lord, do you want to talk about that? And he answered, No, I'd like you to. So here it goes. During worship, the Lord brought up an example of two women. And I have to confess, I have been a Martha for the better part of my Christian life. It has only been in very recent years that the Lord has been able to pry me away from my business to pay attention to Him and leave all the rest to take care of itself. So here's the story told in Luke 10, 38-42, at the home of Martha and Mary. As Jesus and his disciples were on their way, he came to a village where a woman named Martha opened her home to him. She had a sister called Mary, who sat at the Lord's feet, listening to what he said. But Martha was distracted by all the preparations that had to be made. She came to him and asked, Lord, don't you care that my sister has left me to do the work by myself? Tell her to help me. Martha, Martha, the Lord answered, you are worried and troubled about many things, but one only is necessary, and Mary has chosen the better portion, which shall not be taken away from her. And that's the end of that short story. So Martha felt it was her calling and duty to prepare food for her guests and for her house to accommodate them. To that end, she worked very hard and I have no doubts that at times she would have rather been sitting at Jesus' feet than doing all that busy work. However, this story of the two women is very revealing because Jesus said, Mary chose the better part. That means that Martha was not compelled to prepare food for her guests, rather she chose to be about the busy work of preparation. Which brings up the question, but somebody had to do that work? Of course they did. I agree with that. But I also believe, without a doubt, that if Martha had chosen to sit at the Lord's feet with Mary, there would have been a knock at the door, and platters of prepared food would come marching through the door and set up on the table, without any effort from Martha at all. After all, the Lord did feed five thousand. Certainly, he could have motivated someone to put a lavish meal together to serve the occasion, so that Martha could continue to sit at his feet, if she chose that, which was a better part. Or let's say, food didn't show up and everyone went hungry. They were nourished on the words of the Lord. So this presents a different image of Martha, the fact that she voluntarily chose to do the preparation. It reveals a robust woman of the world, one who is comfortable and eager to get involved with the doings of the world, serving and hospitality. Why? Because Jesus said she made a choice to do so. 
Now I for sure can tell you that I would have done one bit better. Knowing that these important people, respected tremendously, were there, and it was the dinner hour, I couldn't have done anything but get up and work in the kitchen as well. But that's exactly the point. That's part of my nature, my fleshly nature, that has to be put to death. Because the most important thing that was going on that entire time was what the Lord was teaching on. Sometimes we have to do violence to our flesh and look a little outrageous or even lazy or irresponsible. How many times have you gone into prayer and the devil has pummeled you and said, you shouldn't be doing this now, you have all that work to do. You're so irresponsible. Lots of times over here, I can tell you that, and to most this might seem truly unfair. I know it did for me for the longest time. I was very angry about that example, especially because I tend to be the Martha most of the time. But in these last few years, I've come to recognize that the things that I see as being so important are really not important at all. That's the difference between the spiritual perspective and the fleshly perspective. So in conclusion, nobody said that this role was forced on her. She chose it. Now we come to Mary. Surely she had chores to do, living with her sister, and I'm sure she had her fair share of the duties. But Mary consciously chose not to get involved in the chores this day. She chose to sit at the Lord's feet and listen to him. I believe because God was the most important person in her life and she had very little interest in food and preparations for company and feasts. She was more taken up with the deeper, more hidden meaning of what was before her. This was not a man she was entertaining, this was God. And the essence of God, his spirituality, was what she hungered for. Company and feasts would come and go, but what Jesus had was more precious to her than anything. But now I understand more about myself. I was comfortable as the Martha. I enjoyed the busy work and preparations in the world. I enjoyed a good meal and would go out of my way to fix one. I enjoyed a clean house, a clean floor, 24-7. But not any longer. Something inside of me has shifted. The Lord is waiting to talk to you. I hear in my spirit and I can't wait to be with Him. He is no longer less important than homemade cookies and a clean floor, no. Now he's more important than anything else. All else can wait until tomorrow. Have you ever experienced that hollow feeling after surfing the net for an hour? You only meant to look up one thing, but other things caught your attention out of curiosity and an hour later you realize, what am I doing? I haven't gotten any deeper with God. I've just heard a bunch of people disputing dates and expounding on timing and the same old news over and over again. This is what I'm getting at, dear family. You can be a Martha and spend hours collecting and weighing data, discussing it with friends and forums, scoring the latest news to see how much closer we are to the rapture, we can study and participate in the Hebrew new moons and the feasts, the Hebrew perspectives and the meaning of the times and the seasons. 
They are fascinating and they seem to be spiritual, but are they truly? When we're done studying all these things, are we any deeper or closer to Jesus as our intimate spouse when we get done with all that work? Yes, I think understanding brings us closer in some ways. I would agree with that. But when we get involved in these things and we, for instance, spend time studying what this prophet or that prophet says and what the newest prophetic fulfillment in the news is, When we're all done with that, to be brutally honest, aren't we exhausted from all pursuing all the different latest interpretations and prophecies, and a little afraid of what is coming upon the world? So what is the priority in our lives? Is it a captivating and intimate relationship with Jesus sitting at his feet? listening to his heartbeat? Or is it knowing the latest scoop on when he's coming? Are we running here and running there to fit the puzzle pieces together and be sound, intelligent, well-read, well-studied, well-educated? Is that our priority? Or are we smitten with the groom and longing only to hold and be held by him? And we are trusting so completely in him that we've left all the rapture timing issues far behind because we are starstruck with our bridegroom. We are listening to his heartbeat and he communicates his sorrows and his needs to us. He longs to spend time with the little boy next door and who has no father so we get a basketball and invite him to play. But as soon as we are done with these things, we run back to our Savior's feet and kiss them, spending the most precious thing we have in this world, our time, lavishing it on him and being in his company. This is the merry paradigm. So do you see? Is it clear to you? I'm not prejudiced against the Jews or the Jewish feasts. I'm just so in love with the one who is the culmination of all laws, all the feasts and traditions, and I'm so taken by him, there is little time for anything else. When he told me to stop seeking the ways of his ancestors and seek him alone, I understood what he meant. He was lonely for his bride. He wants his Marys sitting at his feet. He wants to feel their gentle caress of his brow and see that they trust him so implicitly that they don't fret about the world or its unfolding events. They only care about him in this very moment and what he has to say to them and their eternity together. So, the point about the new and the old wineskins is that the new wine is the love and bridal relationship with Jesus, with God, and the old wine is the way of the laws and the traditions of men. But the new wine is something altogether different. It's not an activity that is taken up with community and times and seasons, it's a timeless, eternal love relationship with Jesus, our Lord. So in order to have this new wine poured into our wineskins, we do have to have new wineskins, and we have to spend a lot of time at his feet. So I believe this is basically what he's talking about when he presented us with the example of the two wineskins and he's longing to fill us with that new wine. But we've got to be free to sit with him and enjoy it. Our minds cannot be taken up with all of the doings of the world, no matter 
how relevant they seem to be. In his eyes, they are not so relevant, because in a heartbeat he could convey to us what his next move is going to be, and it might be missed by everyone. In fact, it probably would be missed by everyone, but those who are very, very close to him would see it. Then Jesus began to speak. My brides, I've taken a long time to lead you and convince you that I'm speaking through this vessel. Ask yourselves, why Lord? And I will answer you. Because you have learned ways that are not pleasing to me, and I have brought you here to offer you my ways. I'm not speaking the truth through her consistently every day and then speaking lies. Again, look at the fruit. Have you grown closer to me through this ministry? Really, ask yourselves that question. If the answer is no, then there is no reason to continue here. If the answer is yes, I have a proposition for you. You are walking in error and I want to straighten your path that you might reach the destination of my heart by a shorter way. Old ways do need to be abandoned. The preoccupation of study is not the short way. The infusion of my spirit and my knowledge, that is the short way. When you sit with me totally empty of yourselves, I fill you to overflowing with myself. If you sit with me filled up already, where can I find space to pour into you? Some of you have filled your vessels with learning. It is in my way. You wonder why you are not progressing in certain areas. That is your answer. There is no space to progress to until you empty yourself of your own agenda. Then. I can fill you. Pray always, Father, if I'm in error, reveal it to me and give me a teachable spirit that responds to your correction. Father, above all, I want to be pleasing to you and your Son. Pray these words from the heart and your prayer will be answered. Lord, I want that. You tremble at my word, stay in that posture, beloved. I will perfect you in truth, if you continue that way. Well, I just wanted to mention to some of you that I have drawn you here for a very good reason. And if you have had quality nourishment, there is no need for you to fight against what I'm trying to teach you here. Rather, I would ask you to embrace my perspective and consider your ways. That's all I have to say, my love. There is nothing more left to say right now, except I love my brides deeply. And while there is time, I want her to be a walking image of myself. And in order for her to attain to that, some things they hold dearly to their heart need to be abandoned. I know you want to change these words to give them hope that they can return to them, but you know those thoughts are not mine. Here I was going to add the words, abandon for now. I don't want you to soften this. Those are your thoughts, not mine. I'm sorry, Lord. I know, I understand. I need you to stand firm in exactly what I say to you and not waver like Peter did. Stand firm and let the arrows fly. I cannot use you to the fullest if you are a reed swaying in the wind.
And for the rest of you, my brides, when was the day I stopped loving and caring for you? Am I asking you to let go of something because I want to deprive you or bless you? Can you trust me? You decide. In the meantime, I will pour out my sweet spirit of repentance and ask you to consider your ways in the light of what I've said to you. In conclusion, I just want to pray a short prayer with you. Lord, please show us what's important for us to spend our time on. Help us to be empty and have a new wineskin that you might fill it with new wine, and not to be distracted or preoccupied with anything, but to be riveted on you, Jesus. And as we watch your eyes and listen to your heart, we're going to know what you want from us and what's next. We don't need to look at the world for those things. Everything we need to know, Lord, is coming from your presence. It's infused knowledge, because we're there with the beating of your heart. So I pray that all of us would have this new wine, this love relationship and this infused knowledge and stop seeking after the things of the world that make us grow weary, exhausted and even sometimes fearful. Help us to trust you so completely, Lord, that you are our only source. Thank you, Jesus. We love you. <laughs>